Welcome back to Japan Archives. We're on episode 54C, and we are going to be finishing our saga about the first emperor. I am your co host, Heather, who is introing this week for your host, me. <laughs> Yes. Hey guys, welcome back again this week. But before we jump into that, I remember last week we had our little query and we were wondering how divine actually was Emperor Jimu. And looking at the sources I have, tracking back the family history to the sun goddess, there seems to be no break in the line in that no one seems to have married outside the realm of the gods and goddesses. So as far as I can tell, Jimu the first emperor was 100% divine. Answers that question. Hmm. We're very quick. I know I always ask. I know we talked about it before we hit record, but the listeners <laughs> will probably love to know how you're doing this week, Heather. Or if not, been a while since we had a weather report. It has been. Oh my goodness. I apologize. It's a beautiful blue sky day. It's a little bit warmer, but night is getting cold. It's cold. It's approaching freezing temperatures. And we live closer to a river, so that really chilly at night, it's it gets unpleasant. And there's no central heating in most homes in Japan. Like, I, I, percentage is pretty high, like 90-something, 90 95, 98 percent. We don't have central heating or a lot of insulation. So that cold air, if you don't, and you also have like wall units generally for your heating and cooling. So... And not every room in the house has that unit. So when we go to the bathroom, we get cold at night. It's going to be the same for me. This new apartment, we have the wall units in the living room, which is good, and the bedroom. Oh, you've got one in the bedroom? Oh. But not in the room we record in. So it's going to be very cold, middle of winter, doing some recording. I'm going to have to wrap up in blankets and everything. You know they make kotatsu tables, right? Like, you could buy a Kotatsu table. There's no space. You know how much stuff I own. You've seen <laughs> how many books I have. I now need a second bookcase for the library. There's no space for a Kotatsu. I'd rather have books than a Kotatsu. But that's just me. I'm sure others would disagree. You could make a book fort. And maybe it would keep the heat in. And then if there's an earthquake when we record, I get crushed by the books. Okay, a space heater. Okay. I'm on board. I'm on board with the space heater. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. How are you doing, Thomas? I'm doing pretty good. Like you said, it is getting colder here. Not as I don't think not as cold as where you are if it's getting to freezing. It's still about, I don't know, you're American. Do you do degrees? I forget. Yeah, we, we're Fahrenheit, but I do uh -huh. understand Celsius a little better now. Okay. Well, here in Tokyo, it's still about 10 degrees, so... Not too cold right now. Yeah, that's that's not... I still don't like it, but not bad. Yeah, not bad. Bearable for now. Mm -hmm. uh, but are you ready to hear about the end of Emperor Jimu's reign? I am indeed. Let's go. Okay. I don't know if you'd really call it a cliffhanger, but we left it the end of last week where once again he was trying to fight Nagasune Hiko. But once more, he's still unable to defeat him. And during the battle, the sky suddenly became overcast and hail began to fall in droves. And from above, down came a wondrous bird. A kite of golden color came to perch atop the emperor's bow. My sources say that the kite was so bright and so very dazzling in splendor that it caused the enemy to become bewildered and even dazzled by it, greatly affecting their fighting prowess. The battle continues to rage on but still not much headway was made between either side. And so Nagasune Hiko decided to send a messenger to the emperor. So what did the message say? Well, I cannot understand, the message began. Why should you be the heavenly child to conquer and steal the lands of everyone already here? After all, you are not the first heavenly child to dwell here. There are others. And one of them I even serve and treat as my lord. He goes by the name of Nigi Hayahi, and he is even wed to my sister, Mi Kayashiki Yabime. I ponder in my heart why you come to take dominion of our lands when you are not the first heavenly child. Now, I don't know about you, Heather, but I kind of see where he's coming from here. He has brought up a point, a, a, a logical point. I agree with you. But there's got to be some reason why, according to the story. Okay, okay. 
So you're reserving judgment till you hear the rest. I I see what you're doing. Well, I have opinions, but I'm I want to learn the history and the story, and we'll we'll go from there. Okay, okay. Emperor Jimu, I wrote here that he did not expect such a message. I mean, well, yeah. Your great great grandmother, the literal goddess of the sun has told you to take over Japan for someone else to then turn around and be like, why are you doing this? There are other heavenly people. Would come as a bit of a shock. The Emperor Jimu, he asks for proof, saying, if this person you talk about is in fact another heavenly descendant, then there would be some proof. So please show me the proof if you have it. And Nagasune Hiko actually did have some proof. He brought forth a heavenly arrow and a quiver set to show up to the emperor. And the emperor Jimu in kind also did the same, showing Nagasune Hiko his own heavenly bow and quiver. And so that kind of set in Nagasune Hiko's mind that yes, emperor Jimu was also sent here by heaven. However, he still did not wish to serve the emperor and treat him as his lord. He was already serving another descendant from heaven, so he didn't want to give in, and he was going to continue his intention of trying to kill Emperor Jimu. At this point, Nagasune Hiko's lord, so the other heavenly descendant, Nikihaya he, he could see that his vassal was never going to give in, and so decided to put him to death himself. After this, the other god, he brought the remaining army to Emperor Jimu and agreed to serve him and the Emperor was said to have been very grateful for this. Finally, the murderer of his brother had been killed even if it had not been accomplished by the Emperor or any of his men. Now for everyone listening, Heather does have a very confused face right now. So enlighten us with your thought process here. So essentially, he was already a descendant, but the... Nigi Hayahi, who was the lord that, and re, I having mean to read the names, by the way, Nagatsune Hiko was serving, essentially wanted to also serve Jimu. So he killed Nagatsune Hiko so that Nigi Hayahi could then serve Jimu. Mm -hmm. It seemed strange in that Nagasune Hiku all this time was fighting against Emperor Jimu, but it actually turned out his own lord that he served did want to subdue himself to Emperor Jimu. So why was he fighting against it? Yeah, it would have been helpful perhaps if Nagasune Hiko had known. I was like, oh no, we're we're gonna go with the, we're gonna go with Jimu. We're going to serve. Maybe Jimu there was a now. miscommunication. Uh, perhaps. Perhaps. Or it might have been one of those things where you learn that the person you serve is ready to give in, but you refuse to accept that the person you followed all this time would do such a thing. So you are ignoring his wishes and you're saying, no, I will continue to fight for the person I thought you were, not the person you're now telling me you are, perhaps. Yeah, that was, that was a twist I was not expecting. Very quick aside, for those who know a bit about the clans of Japan, so one of the big clans of Japan was the Mononobe clan, and it is said in what I read that the descendants of Nigihayahi became the Mononobe clan. Anyway, back to the story. After all this fighting, there were still others in the surrounding area that needed to be quelled, and we're still in the Nara area at this time. In these old texts, these people were given the collective name of Tsuchigumo. And I do want to give an episode over to that concept of Tsuchigumo eventually, as the word has greatly changed over time, where it once meant people who were outcasts or others. It did change over time to become a specific type of Japanese yokai. So we'll yeah. delve into that at some point and see why it changed and look into its origins, perhaps. But anyway... These Suchigumo. One description, bearing in mind this is a very old translation from 1896, it says that these people had very short bodies with long arms and legs, and that they were of the same class as pygmies. And so the emperor sent his men to attack the Suchigumo, throwing nets over them to ensnare and entangle them, and basically slaying them all there and then. Not a very fair way to fight, if I'm honest, but... I guess he is the emperor. Well, he's not emperor yet. So after all the fighting, finally, after all of this time, the emperor then turns around to make a decree, saying 
Six years it has been since we began our expedition to subdue the East, and with the aid of heaven, or Takamagahara, we have accomplished our task. Of course, the other lands, those in the frontier, still have not come under our rule, but where we are now is free. And so here we should make a vast and spacious capital. Let us clear the mountains and forests to build a palace. Let us help the people as they live in nests or caves. Let us bring them laws and justice. And I should also, to thank the spirits of heaven, have children to continue the imperial line. After this decree, he built his first palace. And this he built in the area of Kashihara at the base of Mount Unebi. And this, like I say, we're still in the Nara area. This mountain is in Nara prefecture. With the palace finally erected, the emperor then, as it says in the book, sought afresh for a new wife. I'm, re I'm not un entirely sure what happened to his previous wife that he married years ago on Kyushu, where he had his first two children. Um, the books literally never mention her again. However, this new wife went by the name of Hime Tatara Isuzu Hime, and she was also a heavenly descendant of some degree. After they married, they moved on to have two children by the names of Kami Yawi Mimi and Kami Nunagahi Mimi. So after his marriage and after having his two children, that emperor, that Jimu, now find himself finally decreed as the Emperor of Japan on the 11th of February 660 BC. And interesting enough, this is a date that was only officially selected in 1873. On the very same day, it said that Michi no Omi was given a secret item by the Emperor, which allowed him to use magic to dissipate any lingering spirits in the area. He also gave numerous gifts to all those who had aided him throughout the years on their mission. He gave a house to Michi no Omi, a village to Okeshi the Younger, as well as numerous other things. And it's even said that he gave gifts to the Yatagarasu bird for its help, and that his descendants were of the Tonomori Bay, a kind of guild who were guardians of palaces and shrines. Don't ask me, Heather how a bird had human descendants, but I suppose at this point, if dragons can, why not birds? And after this, after all the fighting and after finally building their capital city, the emperor, he was already old when he began this, but the emperor grew older, eventually choosing Kami Nanagahimimi as the crown prince. And this is the person who would go on to become the second emperor known as Emperor Suize. After all of this time, the emperor finally succumbed to old age, dying in his palace at the age of 127, having reigned for 76 years in total. And he was laid to rest in his tomb northeast of Mount Unebi. And so there you have it. That is the end of the reign of the first emperor, Jimu. What do you think? Taking in the whole of it now. The whole of the story. Well, the going towards the end the age of 127 makes sense since he started out in his 60s it's also an impressive age also i'm 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 wondering because this was bc did people in bc live hundreds of years because uh i mean you also have in in the bible people living into their hundreds or that's true i'm um, at least for these first few emperors the more mythical emperors definitely lived for a lot longer than you would think a normal person would live. And when we start getting to mm. the emperors where they were in the the actual written down histories of Japan, that is when you then start seeing the emperors have more of a normal lifespan. Well, it does make sense that they moved to Nara because there is the, well, for one thing, the the deer park that is in Nara. And those the deer there are still considered to be sacred. Actually, that that kind of area where the that kind of area the area where the the deer reside is a a sacred area, and the the deer there are guarded. And if anyone hurts the deer, they I think you can be imprisoned for hurting the oh, deer. Oh wow! I didn't realize it was that serious. I believe so. I'll have to double check my sources, but that's something I was told before. So have the, having the capital be in Nara matches up with all with all of the history. Now, it's interesting because they moved from, from Kyushu to Nara. So basic, 
basically we've got the, the western part of Japan almost. I think the western part kind of starts more from Nagoya and goes down. So we haven't quite gotten up to Nagoya, but from from Nara, right? Okay, because Nara is close to like Kyoto and Osaka. Yes. So it's quite a big swath of land, <laughs> great tract of land, as it were. <laughs> and just how many years did he end up conquering it? Because he ruled for 76. In his decree, he said six years since they began their expedition to subdue the east. So I'm assuming from that he means after they landed in Nara, perhaps, because before that, every place they went, they then stayed for seven, eight years. But like I think we said at the time, there didn't seem to be much conquering or going on. So I suppose he hasn't counted any of that as part of their expedition, even though technically it is part of the expedition. So he here here's 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 my dilemma. Okay. I know talking about the emperor in Japan is you need to have a certain you know, be respectful talking about the emperor. And so I'm I'm in a a little bit of a bind because looking at it from like my Western perspective, like mm. conquering all these people and taking over. Yeah, I get that. I I, I get a little some some conflict. I feel and things that it, it happened and it's completed it and it's done. But there's also a lot of indigenous people to Japan that I. You don't often you we don't know so much about them. We don't study them so often. There are you know certain like certain tribes of people that were here and were taken over. So it's it's interesting from a his, historical perspective to see how the records say that it happened. Yeah, but it's still it's still a little hmm, conflicted emotion to hear about like the people being taken over. I mean, we don't we don't know anything about them other than they were really conquered besides the the one tribe that you mentioned that perhaps turned into yokai or were they yokai? Was it yokai they took over or was it people they took over? So, it's interesting but it's also a little uh, trying to find the appropriate word. Mixed emotion, I guess. Ah, oh, mixed emotions. I I feel that. I think for me the interesting mm -hmm. thing was when you learn the history of Japan, it's always about fighting with honor, um, fighting without mm. shame. And if those things happen, you do the ritual suicide and things. But then to read that these tribes, almost because they weren't Japanese, because they hadn't been conquered yet, they weren't treated with that same respect, which was later done on the battlefield. For instance, the Suchigumo, they entangled them in nets and slaughtered them. They weren't given a chance to fight. They were, yeah. I mean, I guess the modern equivalent would be they were murdered. There wasn't a battle. There wasn't a fight. Um, so it's interesting to see that. Definitely something that you're not taught when you learn Japanese history, especially if you then consider the samurai and their honor systems. I think for me, that was the thing that stuck out the most in these tales. But like you said, it, it is difficult. And it's it's not our history. You know, True. we're studying it from coming from another culture too. So looking at it from a different perspective, like learning it for the first time versus, you know, being taught certain things. I know you were taught certain things about England in school that you grow up and you learn, oh, that's probably not quite right which i've i have done in america as well being taught something in school then growing up and going yeah oh that was not right <laughs> that was mm, either brushed over or glossed over sometimes inaccurate so hmm yeah it is it it was interesting because there were some elements of the, the divine there was some fantastical and mythical elements, but then also that melding of the more, I guess, modern, so to speak, modern world versus the fantastical world and blending mm. together. So it didn't have everything being mythical, but it didn't have everything just being like the like regular sort of life, which matches up with the, the divinity of Jimu. Also, I had to look up Kite 
because I, I was, I know a kite is a, is a sort of bird, but what does a kite look like? And so I, I did have to look up kite really quickly <laughs> to refresh my memory. It's a common name for birds of prey. For me, I couldn't figure out why the kite. For instance, they already had a divine bird. And when you do research online, mm. a lot of the time you see artwork of the Emperor Jima with the golden bird perched on his bow. And it's all and a lot of the time it is connected in context to the Yatagarasu. However, the books I've been reading do not say it was this bird. So was the kite the Yatagarasu or was it a random other bird which appeared in the moment? I honestly don't know because the books don't say, mm -hmm. but it would seem strange for it not to be the divine bird. And it could be possibly because we're reading the translation from someone else. Mm. And you, especially if it's an older translation, perhaps. Because when was the when was the Nihongi written? I forget. I know this, but I've forgotten. As in the original document. Yeah. So looking at the notes I got on our website, the document was completed in 720 AD. However, it may have begun being compiled all the way back in 714 AD. So we're going with a translation from, was it 1896, you said? Yes. From a document that was written around 700 AD. So even the the Japanese itself it was written in was older Japanese, which is difficult to translate anyway. So it's possible that the original might have... It might have also have just been written in Chinese. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Let me just scroll down to the composition. It was. It was written in Chinese mm. at the time, not Japanese. So it's ancient Chinese into Japanese into English in 1896. So we, we, we it possibly might be there, but mm. neither one of us have any, any hope right now of ever reading ancient Chinese. I Very still can't true. get all the kanji down, so... <laughs> well, thank you, Thomas. No, that's okay. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, but let's let's change it up a bit. Let's try and I don't know what you've got in store for me today, but hopefully it will lighten the mood a little after all of that. Oh my goodness! I think I might be going too light. Okay, actually, because today I have I have a Hayaguchi or you know Japanese tongue twister. <laughs> yeah, so we're we're having um as as the professor would call it, a temperature change. Mm. We are going to be going completely opposite. Um, I am going to read the Hayaguchi as best I can. Okay. And I do have, the, in the, the notes, I have the kanji. And I feel that you would probably recognize at least uh, maybe four of these, perhaps. So, so take a look at the kanji really quickly and see if there's anything there you recognize. The kanji will be in the notes as well on historyjapan.co.uk. Sure will. Um, you know, if I'm honest, I think I know the whole thing today, at least kanji-wise. Oh! But pronunciation-wise, okay, almost... probably not as it is a tongue twister. I just had a quick question, and I don't know if I asked it before yeah. when we did a tongue twister. It's been a long while. But Hayaguchi, we're using Gucci in the context of mouth, obviously, but is the Haya based off Hayaku mm. as in quick? So like quick mouth. Yes, quick mouth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is going to be fun. I did practice this, but with the tongue twister, it, it sometimes really doesn't matter how often you practice because... It's a tongue twister. They're tongue twisters <laughs> for a reason. Akamaki gami, aomaki gami, kimaki gami. That was pretty good. I, 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 I'm, I'm pleased. <laughs> For, for my... I'm not great with tongue twisters regardless, especially in a second language. So... Did, were you right for your kanji? Did you recognize them? Yeah, I saw the red kanji, blue kanji, and yellow kanji. Makigami, well, the gami is paper. Yes. But makigami makes maki roll, which is like rolling. So it's like rolling paper or circled paper. You are so close. So close. So Thomas, Thomas, what what is the month right now? Christmas. What, what month is it? Christmas. Yes, because Christmas stuff has been up since November in Japan. Oh, it's horrible. So, it's like as soon as Halloween finished, Christmas songs in every store, horrible. Yes, like November 1st. Mm -hmm. Like, whoa, mm -hmm. why, why, is, why is Santa here already? 
but the translation is red wrapping paper, blue wrapping paper, yellow wrapping paper. <laughs> oh, rolling paper is wrapping paper. Ah, okay. I like it. Might not be. It's not themed to the episode, but definitely themed for the time of year. Yes, we are definitely not themed for the episode. But I, that that was fortuitous. Is that the right word I want to use? Fortuitous because we that. kind of got a little bit heavy, so we lightened it up. Like it, so it doesn't it doesn't match. But yes, Christmas is coming. Mm, Christmas is coming. Ah, <sighs> it will be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's going to be fine. Everything's going to be beautiful. It'll be great. It is going to be Yay, great. Christmas. <laughs> Yay. Well, thank you for the tongue twister today. I liked that one. Not what I expected at all. Well, I I, I was going to go in one direction. I was going to go with a proverb, mm. but then I thought, you know, I, I today felt like a, a tongue twister kind of day. And then I found this one and it themed with December. So perfect choice. Well, thank you. Um, what? Well, are we done? Maybe we're done. Is it time to say I think goodbye? We're done. All right, boys and girls. I almost time to say the, goodbye. I almost said now it's time to say goodbye to all our family. Oh no. God. Help. Help. Do we want to talk do we want to briefly mention what we're gonna plan for next week then? Yes, let's do that. We have a the eleventh bonus episode in the works, so that will be coming soon. But next week, it's going to be a interesting one, kind of a collab, no? I found I found an interesting article about the life of a poet. Um, so I want to get into his history, and Heather will be getting into his poems for that episode. So I'm looking forward to that. be interesting to do another collab type one. It's been a while since we did that. So it's going to be good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, but... Anyway, time to sign out. You you know by now, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Japan Archives. The Instagram, nexus underscore travels, N-E-X-U-S underscore travels. And if you want to read the show notes for today or do some extra research on Japanese history, you can check out our database over at japanarchivespodcast.com or historyofjapan.co.uk. But that is everything from me this week. What about you, Heather? I think that that might do it for me as well. All right, then. Well, until next week, then, guys. Speak to you later. Matane. Mina san, kyosukete. Matane.